Throughout the NFL's storied history, players have emerged and solidified their place in sports history. However, amidst the gold jackets and all pro honors, players would arise whose careers would be marked by controversy and scandal and would be banned from the NFL. Pro football player Ray Rice has been fired and suspended indefinitely by the NFL, all after a graphic security video was released today. Overnight, San Francisco 49ers quarterback Colin Kaepernick refusing to stand during the national anthem. And he's receiving heavy boos here. The NFL is suspending Adam Pacman Jones indefinitely. Death threats, gunshots, and allegations that the man who arranged the shooting was Pac-Man Jones himself. In the league for five years with the Rams, and he ends up getting caught up in a drug deal. He was also convicted, solicitation to kill the judge and the cooperating witness. Ray Rice, hailed as one of college football's most dominant running backs, ascended to stardom under the mentorship of Rutgers head coach Greg Schiano. Bursting onto the scene in 2005, Rice showcased his ability with an impressive 1,120 rushing yards, solidifying his reputation as a rising talent. With consecutive seasons surpassing 1,000 rushing yards, Rice's junior year thrusted him into the NFL spotlight. In 2007, he set alight the gridiron, amassing a staggering 2,012 rushing yards, clinching All-American honors and rewriting Rutgers record books. Entering the NFL as a Baltimore Raven, Rice's sophomore season marked a breakout with 1,339 rushing yards, propelling him to the Pro Bowl and All-Pro recognition. His pinnacle came in 2012, securing a Super Bowl victory for the Ravens. However, his illustrious career took a dark turn on September 8, 2014 out of the other big aspect of this story and that's domestic abuse. This very high profile incident has started something of a national conversation about a topic that of course is very personal to so many Americans. Speculation had been swirling about a potential domestic violence incident involving Ray Rice and his wife, Janae. Initially, Rice faced a mere two-game suspension. However, when video evidence of the altercation surfaced, both the Baltimore Ravens and the NFL swiftly took action. Disturbing new video tonight of an NFL football player knocking out his fiance. We knew of the video that it existed but we didn't see Ray Rice knock his then fiance out until TMZ Sports released this video this morning. The footage, shockingly aired by TMZ, depicted a heated exchange between Rice and Janae, escalating to a violent blow from Rice that sent his partner tumbling, that knocked her out cold. In a disturbing twist, he was then captured dragging Janae's limp body out of the elevator, prompting inquiries from hotel staff about her condition. According to reports, Ravens owner Steve Biscioti was the first of the key members of the organization to see the video. His immediate response was that Rice needed to be released immediately. He then gathered GM Ozzie Newsom, head coach John Harbaugh, and team president Dick Cass to confirm the decision. Newsom and Harbaugh spoke to Rice on the phone, informing him of the Ravens' decision, while Biscioti contacted Commissioner Roger Goodell directly to let him know what was unfolding. Hours later, the Baltimore Ravens dropped the hammer with a scathing declaration. The Baltimore Ravens terminated the contract of running back Ray Rice this afternoon. With three years remaining on his lucrative deal and a hefty sum exceeding 10 million hanging in the balance, Rice's world was turned upside down. The termination not only stripped him of future earnings, but also severed ties with the Ravens. As if that wasn't enough, NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell wasted no time promptly slapping Rice with an indefinite suspension from the league. The statement noted that any contract offered to Mr. Rice would be automatically voided by the league until instructed otherwise. Initially facing charges of third degree aggravated assault, Rice's legal woes took a dramatic turn. The former NFL running back opted for court supervised counseling to mend his ways, a move that ultimately led to drop charges. Accepted in a pre-trial intervention program, Rice dodged a trial and upon successful completion of the program, the charges against him were dismissed. 
Commissioner Goodell's initial reaction to the entire event, pre-video release, was a simple two-game suspension. The Ray Rice incident caused them to review and increase the domestic violence suspension policy from two games to six, with a lifetime ban for anybody who does it twice. That was before the video footage was released, at which time both Goodell and the Ravens pivoted considerably on their initial position. In a whirlwind of controversy, Rice stunned the sports world by swiftly appealing his indefinite suspension. He felt the punishment was too harsh. A hearing was held in November of 2014, giving Rice an opportunity to defend his position and argue the suspension. Rice won the case, and the NFL was forced to overturn his suspension and reinstate him immediately. The indefinite suspension was was deemed excessive and without cause, and so Rice was free to play football again. The grim reality was that no team dared to touch him. The potential fallout of signing a player embroiled in such a scandal, complete with damning video evidence of domestic violence, was too risky for any NFL franchise to entertain. The former Ravens running back never played another down in the NFL, but he did file a wrongful termination lawsuit with the league. He was reportedly awarded $1.5 million in the settlement. The NFL's hand was forced in the unsettling saga of Ray Rice's potential reinstatement. While it it remains uncertain if they exerted influence to prevent teams from offering Rice a contract, the league's involvement cannot be discounted. There is growing outrage tonight after an unarmed African American teenager was shot and killed by police. The police shot this boy outside my apartment. It's gone viral, showing officers arresting a suspect who later died. A patrol car arrives at the scene. And seconds later, shot fired. Tamir Rice, who was 12 years old, died later in hospital. As the crowd and players stand, you can see Kaepernick kneeling on the sideline. Former San Francisco quarterback Colin Kaepernick is not an abusive man. What he is, is an unapologetic activist for the things that he believes in, many of which are very real issues in America today. However, his actions divided the NFL crowd, and the league was not a fan of that in the slightest. This is Kaepernick's story, one of few players who has a genuine claim for being blackballed by the league. Colin Kaepernick's journey in the NFL began when he was drafted by the San Francisco 49ers in 2011, handpicked by head coach Jim Harbaugh. Coming from a successful college career in Nevada, Kaepernick's dual threat abilities made him a highly sought after prospect. His time at Nevada saw him achieve remarkable milestones including surpassing 10,000 passing yards and 4,000 rushing yards, solidifying his reputation as one of the best dual threat quarterbacks in history, alongside names like Robert Griffin and Lamar Jackson. Despite initial success with the 49ers, Kaepernick faced challenges in subsequent seasons, including coaching changes and injuries. Amidst turmoil within the 49ers organization, Kaepernick's performance declined, leading to a loss of his starting role and a desire for a fresh start elsewhere. Following undisclosed discussions, Kaepernick reconciled with the 49ers, returning to prepare for the 2016 season. With the competitive atmosphere in training camp, he aimed for the starting quarterback role under new coaching leadership. But as the 2016 preseason approached, Kaepernick's path took an unexpected turn. On September 1st, 2016, Colin Kaepernick and teammate Eric Reed took a knee during the American National Anthem before a preseason game against the San Diego Chargers. Originally, he had decided to simply take a seat during the anthem. He had done so for the opening game of the preseason, but few had noticed since he was in street clothes for the game and largely out of sight. It was then a conversation with former NFL player and Green Beret in the Army, Nate Boyer, who had suggested taking a knee as a form of compromise rather than sitting. Some felt that Kaepernick sitting was disrespectful to the military, and so Boyer suggested he instead took a knee as soldiers do before a fallen comrade's grave, showing their respects. Kaepernick was kneeling to bring awareness to systematic racial inequality and instances of police brutality towards black people. Several men had been shot while unarmed that summer, and Kaepernick decided to stand against what he felt was a major problem in America. Of course, kneeling for the anthem heavily divided the crowds. He was booed maliciously throughout that preseason game for supposedly disrespecting the anthem and the American flag. And the decision to take the knee very quickly gained viral attention, both in the national media and online. 
What followed was a media frenzy, and everybody had an opinion. Was he right or wrong in his decision? Did his choice to kneel during the national anthem show what he had hoped it would, or cause more of a snowball effect that distracted many from the actual message he was trying to get across? Kaepernick had announced that he would donate $1 million of his almost $12 million salary to charity, attempting to make it clear that his stance wasn't anti-American. He stated, I love America. I love people. That's why I'm doing this. I want to help make America better. Whether they liked it or not, the NFL was attracting national attention for something one of their players was opting to do. It was divisive, and even President Obama had weighed in, supporting Kaepernick for his decision to stand up for some real, legitimate issues. In terms of Mr. Kaepernick, he's exercising his constitutional right to make a statement. I think he cares about uh, some real, legitimate issues that have to be talked about. Roger Goodell did not feel the same. Kaepernick's actions resulted in him having the highest selling jersey in the league, and many other players and staff also began to follow his lead during the national anthem. Goodell chimed in by stating that he didn't necessarily agree with what the 49ers quarterback was doing, something that would become extremely clear further down the line. Amidst all the off-field chaos surrounding Kaepernick and the Niners that season, they went 2-14. He had played in 12 games, struggling to make the impact he once had, and at the end of the season, opted out of his contract with the team. He was among the best quarterbacks available in free agency, but something very odd started to happen. Quarterbacks who were clearly below his standard were getting picked up and signed to other teams, but his negotiations on a deal anywhere around the league fell silent. Kaepernick found himself in a career limbo, with whispers suggesting NFL owners were blackballing him to sidestep potential controversies. Whether it was fear of dividing fan bases or distracting media attention, Kaepernick remained sidelined, a symbol of the league's unease with outspoken activism. In fact, since the last snaps he took for the San Francisco 49ers in that 2016 season, Kaepernick hasn't played another down in the NFL. Further demonstrations continued supporting Kaepernick's initial movement despite his absence, something that sparked comments from President Trump, demanding that any son of a bitch not standing for the anthem be thrown out. Several tweets from Trump backed his stance on the events further, and the NFL continued to be a part of a mainstream media controversy it wanted nothing to do with. Goodell had made his stance apparent, leaving many unsurprised when Colin Kaepernick was absent from the field in 2017. Was it due to his performance or injuries, or was it the league's way of silencing a vocal activist? The truth may lie in the murky waters of NFL politics, where opposing voices are swiftly muffled. On October 15th, 2017, Kaepernick filed a grievance against the NFL. He accused all 32 teams of collusion, refusing him a place in the league. Almost a year later in August 2018, it was announced that the quarterback had enough evidence to push for a full hearing, which was promptly avoided and swept under the rug. Both Kaepernick and his teammate Eric Reed, who had also suggested there was some collusion keeping both players unsigned, reached a settlement agreement with the league. The settlement figures were never made public, and all parties signed confidentiality agreements that would keep all details of the matter well and truly silenced. The NFL and Commissioner Goodell were determined to bury the scandal for good, but whatever was agreed upon seemed to be a pact they weren't eager to flaunt, desperate to keep it under wraps and far from public scrutiny. Since then, Kaepernick has been on quite the ride. He was made the face of a night campaign that once again divided the crowds. The campaign was titled dream crazy, and Kaepernick added, believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. In what was very clearly a publicity stunt from the NFL, Kaepernick was invited to work out for NFL teams in 2019. The event was originally to be held at the Atlanta Falcons training facility, but just hours before it was due to begin, Kaepernick moved it to a high school facility over an hour away. According to the quarterback's camp, Mr. Kaepernick requested a legitimate process, and from the outset, the NFL League office has not provided one. Most recently, the NFL has demanded that as a precondition to the workout, Mr. Kaepernick sign an unusual liability waiver that addresses employment-related issues and rejected the standard liability waiver from physical injury proposed by Mr. Kaepernick's representatives. Kaepernick was not informed of which wide receivers he would be working with, and had requested information on which teams, coaches, and scouts would 
would attend, which he also did not receive. Beyond that, the QB had requested that all media be allowed into the workout to observe and film, and for an independent film crew to be there to ensure the event was completely transparent. The NFL suspiciously denied that request. Unhappy with the operating standards set by the NFL at the facility they had lined up for him, he moved the workout elsewhere. According to reports, a team sent a representative to watch, and Kaepernick received zero offers following the event. Kaepernick was frustrated by the entire thing, still feeling as though he was being outcasted by the NFL. I've been denied for three years. We all know why. I came out here and showed it today, in front of everybody. We have nothing to hide, Kaepernick said. So we're waiting for the 32 owners, the 32 teams, Roger Goodell, all of them to stop running. Stop running from the truth. Stop running from the people. To this day, and now 36 years old, Colin Kaepernick never featured again in the NFL. No matter how you feel about his political stance, or his decision to kneel to the national anthem, there is no denying that his evident barring from the NFL is a little suspicious. When he hit free agency in 2017, he was still undoubtedly one of the best talents available among free agent quarterbacks. Teams and their owners avoided him, and even when the NFL made what looked like a gesture of support for Kaepernick with an organized workout, the actual facts of that event beneath the surface told a very different story. Roger Goodell and the league made life difficult on Kaepernick from the moment he took that knee, and the doors have been locked tight on him ever since. Daryl Henley was a consensus All-American at UCLA who had gone on to be drafted in the second round of the 1989 draft by the Los Angeles Rams. He was a player who seemingly set himself up for success both in the league and in life. Graduating with a degree in finance and having a supportive family behind him as he began his journey in the NFL. Henley was a starting corner for the Rams from the year he was drafted through the early 90s. He had managed 12 career interceptions between 1989 and 1994 while playing 76 games for Los Angeles. It turns out that Daryl Henley was living a double life, part-time NFL star and part-time drug lord. Word had it that Daryl Henley fancied himself quite the gangster, and we're not talking about a casual reference here. The Rams cornerback genuinely saw himself as some kind of underworld kingpin. Henley was running a drug ring and trafficking hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of cocaine with the help of a small team. It all came crashing down when his girlfriend, Tracy Ann Donajo, gave him up. At the time, she was just 19 years old, and Henley had met her while she was cheerleading for the Rams. Donajo was drawn to his extravagant lifestyle, relishing the luxury of lavish nights out and gifts she couldn't afford on her modest income as a cheerleader and part-time waitress. When she was caught with over $250,000 worth of cocaine, she pointed the finger directly at the Rams cornerback and he was promptly hunted down. Henley was running the drug ring with several individuals, one of which was a childhood friend of his. When he was caught, he denied his involvement, stating that he was simply a frontman for his friend. Donahoe had made a plea deal to serve as a witness in convicting Henley and three other members of the unit in exchange for a reduced sentence. When questioned, Henley admitted he had given money to his friend, but had received no financial return for the cocaine deals. He didn't know it quite yet, but Daryl Henley was about to dig his grave much deeper. While in jail awaiting his sentence, Henley had managed to get a mobile phone into his cell, which he used to contact his family and his fiancée, who had just given birth to his baby girl. He then used that phone to have a conversation with a man named Joey Gambino, or so he thought. This man, Gambino, was a mafia member who had an upcoming heroin deal he was willing to cut Henley in on. The two got talking, with Henley agreeing to the heroin gig because he he was desperate for money, and Gambino eventually offered to murder both the young woman who had given Henley up and the judge overseeing his case. Desperate at this point, Henley agreed to Gambino's suggestion. The only problem was that this man was not a mafia boss, nor was his name Gambino. He was an undercover federal agent who Henley had just told to kill the court judge and his girlfriend. He was handed an extra 21 year sentence on top of his initial 20 year term and is still locked up to this very day. It's safe to say he's effectively sidelined from the NFL with no hope of returning to the field anytime soon. The Henley case raised a lot of questions. The conversation he had with an undercover cop suggesting he murder Henley's judge and ex-girlfriend is quite literally the definition of entrapment and came at a time when Henley was already behind bars and desperate for money 
to continue fighting his case. He is still in prison to this day, although the case has stirred further investigation multiple times. Several jury members had very questionable circumstances, including blatant racism and use of drugs, as well as discussing the case outside of court. Donahue was only given a four-month sentence at a halfway house, and when the case was dug up and brought back to the forefront, those involved with Hanley were all released from their sentences while he remained in jail. The NFL stayed well clear of this one, and Henley's talent as a football player was wasted. Was he actually a mob boss? Was he the subject of an open and shut case? That perhaps wasn't as clear as those prosecuting him had actually believed. Maybe, but regardless of those facts or what those who know the case believe to be true, the overall event is another dark mark on the NFL and its players. Is there any doubt in your mind that Pac-Man Jones sent the men to shoot you? No doubt. Couples of Adam Pac-Man Jones new and deep with twists. Where's the profile? None of that, man. Where's the profile? According to court documents, Jones became enraged during a fight over money with a dancer. When a security guard grabbed Jones, he reportedly said, I'm gonna kill ya. Matter of fact, all yous are gonna get it. At the time, the Tennessee Titans cornerback was serving a season-long suspension for his role in a fight and shooting at a Las Vegas strip club four months earlier. Sometimes it seems that Pac-Man Jones's life Every day is somebody else. Can I have my own privacy, man? is like one continuous punt return. A very different story tonight about He's placed under arrest for disorderly conduct. Jones tripped to this strip club, according to new information uncovered by Outside the Lines, would unfold in a strikingly similar way. Death threats, gunshots, and allegations that the man who arranged the shooting was Pac-Man Jones himself. The sixth overall pick in the 2005 NFL Draft, Adam Pac-Man Jones' career spanned over 13 seasons. He played for the Tennessee Titans, Dallas Cowboys, Cincinnati Bengals, and Denver Broncos. Unlike Daryl Henley's swift NFL exit due to serious allegations, Jones' journey was fraught with a string of serious incidents spanning a lengthy period. Jones was a constant thorn in the side of the league, and it started before he'd even played a snap. Originally from Atlanta, Pac-Man Jones had gone to a college in West Virginia, making a name for himself as a lockdown corner. He had received all Big East honors in back-to-back -back years for the Mountaineers and decided to forego his senior year and head for the NFL draft. The Tennessee Titans needed defensive help and drafted Jones early, but would come to question their decision before training camp had even begun. Two weeks prior to reporting for camp, Jones was arrested by Nashville police at the team's headquarters for an incident that had occurred at a nearby night club. The charges were eventually dropped, but Jones was just getting started. Less than a year later, and shortly after the conclusion of his rookie season, Jones was arrested again in his home state of Georgia. He was charged with possession of marijuana, but escalated the matter further and swung at the officer trying to arrest him. He was handcuffed and charged with obstruction. Just two months later, he was spotted once again with a crowd at a Nashville gas station. This time, a fight had broken out and gunshots were fired. But on this occasion at least, he wasn't directly involved. In a whirlwind first year in the NFL, Adam Pac-Man Jones racked up three incidents. Just before the season kickoff, he found himself in hot water once more. This time, it was for public intoxication and disorderly conduct. Allegedly spitting in a woman's face, he faced an assault accusation, resulting in a six-month probation sentence handed down by a local judge. It was just the beginning of a turbulent journey. Jones had evidently developed a troubling pattern, as two months later he found himself in trouble once more for assault at a nightclub, again accused of spitting in a woman's face. The Tennessee Titans took action, suspending him for one game in the 2006 season. The signs were there that Pac-Man Jones was a loose cannon, but it all escalated into a major incident during the NBA All-Star Weekend in 2007. Jones was in Vegas for the event and had reportedly decided to throw hundreds of dollars at strippers inside a local gentleman's club before starting an argument with the strippers and various people inside the club. Moments later, gunshots were fired outside, with three people being shot 
shot on the club's premises. Jones wasn't the shooter, nor is there any way to tie his altercation inside the club with the shooting. But Gene Upshaw described it best with his comments. Upshaw was the executive director of the NFL Players Association at the time and posed the question, how is it possible to be in the wrong place at the wrong time so many times? Jones was ordered to pay $1.3 million in damages for the incident, and two of the three people who were shot sued him, despite him not pulling the trigger. He was ordered to pay another $9.6 million to the victims, one of which was paralyzed from the waist down in the shooting. While he was waiting official charges for the incident, the NFL stepped in. Players are not often suspended for an entire season. In fact, it's only happened nine times. Times, with another handful of players receiving indefinite suspensions. The cornerback was suspended for the entire 2007 season. Roger Goodell explained in a written statement to Jones that I must emphasize that this is your last opportunity to salvage your NFL career. Jones had initially planned to appeal a suspension, but after multiple meetings with the league office and Commissioner Goodell, he dropped his appeal and vowed to make significant changes. He even took out a full page ad in the Nashville Tennessean apologizing to fans of his team. And yet, less than one week after he dropped his appeal, another incident incident occurred in Atlanta, another strip club, and another incident Jones was far too close to. A man had had an altercation with Jones inside the club before leaving and getting in his car. Moments later, the car was attacked by gunfire, and in a statement released later that year by a gang member, Jones' name was mentioned. Marcel Easterling was part of a gang with a man named Edward Slugga Morris. Easterling gave a detailed statement about several Atlanta murders, including the incident at the nightclub involving Pac-Man Jones. According to the statement presented, Jones had asked and offered to pay Slugga Morris to shoot the man he had been in an argument with inside the club. Later that year, Morris was charged with three unrelated murders and several other gang-related charges. While all this was going on, Adam Jones was running an NFL career in parallel. The Titans eventually got sick of his antics and traded him to Dallas, just three years after drafting him with the sixth overall pick. He was reinstated from his year-long suspension on August 28, 2008, and was cleared to play for the Cowboys that season. He didn't even make it two months before he was in trouble again. This time, he'd gotten drunk at a Dallas hotel and got into a fight with a bodyguard who had literally been assigned to him by the team to keep him out of trouble. He was suspended indefinitely, although no charges were filed. With the suspension eventually being set to six games. Dallas cut him from the team the following January. His name wasn't mentioned again until more than one year later. Having spent the entire 2009 season absent from the league, the Cincinnati Bengals were prepared to give him a second chance in the league, something they had done notably on several occasions with players on the past. Jones signed a two-year deal with a contract that heavily protected the Bengals against Jones should he get himself into further trouble. Somehow, someway, this would be the turning point in his career. Well, for the most part, Jones went on to have a resurgent career with the Bengals, receiving first-team All-Pro honors in 2014 and a trip to the Pro Bowl in 2015. He had 12 interceptions with the team and forced five fumbles, while signing multiple extensions during his stay between 2010 and 2017. It was only after his career had come to a close in Cincinnati that the old school Jones resurfaced. In 2023, more than six years after his last action with the Bengals, in years after his retirement, he was arrested by airport police on a morning flight due to being an unruly passenger. Jones had plenty to say about this one when he was released. Jones ended up having a far longer career than it looked. Players that were banned from the NFL. Players whose careers were filled with controversy and scandal and made the NFL's blacklist.